Hi everybody, Mrs. Britton is on. Welcome to my channel. As you know by now, we study the Bible and we have begun with the book of the Revelation because we want to ascertain, we want to learn what the destiny of this earth is, where we are we heading. And based on the studies we have done so far, it seems as if we are heading in the right direction to our divine destiny and we are closer to that destiny than you and I would want to believe. I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel, share, tell someone Mrs. Britton is on and that you are learning a tremendous lot from the Word of God. Yes, friends, subscribe and get your friends also to learn what Jesus is saying to us because you don't want to go to heaven alone. You want your family and your friends also to be in heaven with you. Also remember to have your Bible close at hand so that you can follow on as I read the text. If however you don't have your Bible uh, with you at the moment, remember I write all the texts in the description below so you can always go back and look at those texts and read them for yourself. Because in my belief, I think persons must read or hear for themselves what the Bible is saying to them. So today, the topic of our lesson is eating the scroll. And this is the second part of the interlude between Trumpets 6 and 7. In our last lesson, lesson 34, we dealt with that first part where the angel, that strong, robust angel, who is Jesus himself, straddled the land and the sea, symbolizing the universality in the spread of the gospel. Every nation, kindred, town, people, island, continent will hear the last message of warning to the earth. And as that angel straddled the land and sea, one foot in the sea, one on the land, he held a book in his hand, the book of the eternal truths of God's word. So now we are going into lesson 35 and we will be looking at the next part of what happens in the interlude, eating the scroll. So as we begin, and as is the norm, let us pray. Almighty Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for doing all within your power to save us. You created us to live eternally. And Lord, your word guides us daily to how we can have access to this eternal life. May the Spirit attend us now as we study. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. And our topic for today is eating the scroll. We will begin with uh, Revelation chapter 10 verses 8 to 11. Revelation chapter 10 verses 8 to 11. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will be, it will make your stomach bitter. But in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Eating in the Bible is used to describe the acceptance of a message from God in order to proclaim it to the people. That's why, you know, I'm sure when I pray, it you know, must click something in your brain. You know, Mrs. Britton always, always says, feed me. Yes, 
God's word is bread sent down from heaven. Jeremiah said, your words were found and I did eat them for they were the joy and rejoicing of my heart. So when the Bible talks about eating the word of God, it is used to describe the acceptance of a message from God in order to proclaim it to the people. Let's see if this is so. We always go back to the Bible. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 8 and we'll go to Jeremiah 15 verse 16. Ezekiel is a pretty long text. I will put it on the screen. Um, however, I will not read all of it or maybe I should. It's Ezekiel 2 verses 8 to chapter 3 verse 11. Let's see what eating the word means. Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. When he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go. Speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll, which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples of unintelligible speech or difficult language, whose words you cannot understand. But I have sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, since they are not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery, harder than flint, have I made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them or be dismayed before them, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, take it into your heart, all my words, which I speak to you, and listen closely. Go to the exiles, to the sons of your people, and speak to them and tell them whether they listen or not. Thus says the Lord. And the Jeremiah 15 verse 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name. O Lord God of hosts. Eating in the Bible is used to describe the acceptance of a message from God in order to proclaim it to the people. Like God said to Ezekiel, eat the word. Jeremiah says, I found your word and I ate them. When the message is received, however, it is good news. But when it is proclaimed, it sometimes results in bitterness as it is resisted and rejected by many. So when the word is proclaimed, when the prophet or the priest or the pastor or the laity proclaims the message, they teach the message, they preach the message, it's sweet because it's God's word. However, when people reject the message, or resist the message, then it is bitter. So John's bittersweet experience in eating the scroll 
representing the book of Daniel, is related to the unsealing of Daniel's end time prophecies. John here represents God's end time uh, remnant church that is commissioned to proclaim the everlasting gospel at the close of Daniel's time prophecy or the 1260 days. So friends, that book which was handed to John and the angel who is Jesus said, eat it. That book represented the time prophecy of Daniel, which we read about in our very last video. And John there represents the remnant church of God who is commissioned to go preach the gospel, go preach Daniel's end time prophecy, go preach the everlasting gospel. Let the world know what is going on. And, you know, let us find out about that commission of the church. And we are going to read Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. And it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God! And give glory to him, because the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of waters. So there is a call to worship. Oh yes, there is a call to reverence God, to turn back to God. That's the commission of this remnant church in the time we are living. Worship of the Creator. He created heaven, earth, sea, all there is. He is the Creator and the call is to worship Him and to return to Him. So the remnant church is commissioned to preach that gospel and also to preach the, gospel, the, the time prophecy as recorded in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. We read it in the last um, video it talks about the uh, 2000 sorry talks about the 1260 days which is a cutout from the 2300 days it says he will speak against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law and they will be given into his hand for a time and at times and half a time so we studied that in the last video the persecution which the church experienced during the dark ages from 538 to 1798 a span of 1260 years so friends as the word of god is preached it's sweet you know the preacher is hopeful that the listening public will respond positively. But when the listening public rejects the word of God, it becomes bitter, sorrowful, mournful, and woeful. Context indicates that John's vision points to another bittersweet experience at the conclusion of the prophetic 2300 year period. When, on the basis of Daniel's prophecies, uh, there was a group of people called the Millerites, they thought that Christ would return in the year 1844. That, and that message was sweet. Jesus would return. That message was sweet to them. However, when Christ did not appear as expected, they experienced a bitter disappointment and searched the scriptures for a clearer understanding. They experienced a bitter disappointment and searched the scriptures for a clearer understanding. So we see a twofold interpretation of eating the scroll. The angel handed that scroll to John and said, eat it. And John represented the uh, remnant church 
And they were commissioned to preach the gospel, the everlasting gospel, that Jesus is the creator. And that we should fear him, reverence him, honor him, worship him. And secondly, they were commissioned to preach about the prophecy, uh, the 1260-day year prophecy of Daniel chapter 725. But this Eating this bittersweet experience or sweet bitter experience also had reference to that group of people called the Millerites who around 1842, 1843, 1844, they were studying and pouring over the word of God. They wanted an understanding of the word of God and they got the time period correct that the 2300 year prophecy ended in the autumn of 1844 and that was sweet to them and also they concluded that the event to occur at the end of 1844 or in 1844 was the return of jesus and that was honey to them jesus would return to the earth sadly though they misinterpreted the event that was to occur or begin at the year 1844. And that was a very, very bitter experience for them. However, they did not give up. They went back to the word of God. They prayed, they fasted. So God opened up their understanding and gave them the meaning of the event in 1844 not the return of jesus but another event which we will find out about as we continue in our study of the revelation this has raised up to proclaim the message of the second coming in connection with the prophecies in daniel and revelation friends yes there's a group of people who are preaching a return to jesus to worship him as creator to fear him, to honor him, to reverence him. There is a group of people who is, that group is correctly uh, disseminating the information from the word of God on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. So what is John ordered to do? Let's look at Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to nations. And they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So what is John ordered to do? This passage in Revelation chapter 11 continues the scene in Revelation 10. Remember, there's an interlude between trumpets 6 and 7. So tr trumpet 6 is sounded already and trumpet 7 will sound. But between those two, there is an interlude. So what I just read in Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 is a continuation of what is, has happened in Revelation 10. John was commanded to measure the temple, to measure the altar, to measure the worshippers. Now the concept of measuring in the Bible refers figuratively to judgment. Whenever we read about measure in the Bible, it means judgment. Let's look at that in Matthew chapter 7 verse 2. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by the standard you measure, you will be measured. Let me read it again. By the way you judge, you will be judged. And by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you. So whenever we read about measuring, it's about judgment. And John is commissioned to measure. Measure the temple, the altar, the worshippers. The temple that was to be measured is in heaven, where Jesus ministers for us. The reference to the temple, the altar, and the worshippers point to 
the day of judgment. I know some of you know a saying, but we've never heard about this before. And I wouldn't doubt you because the popular churches of the day, the popular churches among us do not preach the time prophecies. Neither do they preach the day of judgment. So John is commissioned to measure because the day of judgment is come. Let's see what Leviticus 16 verses 16 to 19 have to say about the day of judgment. The day of judgment had reference to the sanctuary service. Read about it in Leviticus. The sanctuary service led up to that day of atonement, that one day in the year which was extremely important to Israel. Leviticus 16, 16 to 19, he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. With his finger, he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it. And from the impurities of the sons of Israel, consecrate it. Yes, friends, this day was a day of measuring. A day of measuring as God judged his people. Thus, in Revelation chapter 11 verse 1, this refers to the judgment that takes place just before the second coming of Jesus. Yes, there's a judgment, we call it, or it is named the investigative judgment. The judgment concerns exclusively God's people, the worshippers in the temple. How very apt. John was ordered to measure. Measure the worshippers, the temple, the altar measure and we we read in uh matthew chapter 7 that measure refers to judging who will be judged who will be judged in the interim between the sixth and the seventh trumpets the worshipers those who uh confess the name of christ those who have taken on the name of Christian, a follower of Christ, they will be judged prior to the second coming of God. It is right there in the word of God. John was ordered to measure the worshipers, meaning that the worshipers, those who profess the name of Jesus, they will be judged in that interlude. Friends, Revelation 11 one shows that the heavenly sanctuary message lies at the heart of the gospel proclamation, which includes the vindication of God's character. As such, it gives the full dimension of the gospel message regarding the atoning work of Christ and his righteousness as the only means of salvation for human beings. Yes, friends. I know I have piqued your interest because it's not part of the, the teaching and preaching of the popular churches. But there it is in Revelation. Between the sounding of the sixth trumpet and the seventh, the church is commissioned to preach the gospel, to preach the prophecies, the time prophecies. And as this is going on, Judgment, the measuring of God's people occurs. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Now, it's a reality. 
it is a reality that God's people will be judged. Yes. And this judgment, we're going to study more about it as we continue with Revelation. But let me just tell you that this investigative judgment is going on right now. Because we are living in the time of the end between the sixth trumpet, which has already been sounded, and the seventh trumpet, which is yet to sound. And what is happening in that interlude, in that interim? The everlasting gospel is being preached. Fear God. Come back to God. Honor him as creator and redeemer. The time prophecies are being preached by a special group of people. Because the popular churches are not preaching it. But there's a special group of people whom the Lord has chosen, the remnant of God, to preach the time prophecies. Third, the measuring of the, the, the worshippers of God occur. The, the judgment of God's people, those who profess to know him, occurs during this interim. Friends, it, it is a very solemn time we are living in. And every Christian who names the names of, name of Christ has to sit up and pay attention. Yes, I like to use that um, little phrase. Sit up and pay attention. Everyone who names the name of Christ. No, it's not time to dilly-dally. One foot in the bank, one foot, one foot in the river, one on the bank. There has to be a clear line of demarcation between the professed, follow of Christ and the one who doesn't follow Christ. The lines between those groups should not be blurred. The lines should be very, very distinct. And during this interlude, God is looking at those who profess his name. Maybe your name as a Christian came up already. Maybe my name came up already. Judgment is beginning in the house of God. Yes, I know you are listening carefully because you haven't heard that before. Judgment is beginning in the house of God. While we are alive, judgment is going on. All who profess his, profess his name will be judged. In other words, have they kept faithful to their profession? Are they being sanctified by the Spirit of God? Or are they jokers, just carrying his name in vain, but living like the world? These are solemn times. And friends, remember, if you're a Christian already and you name the name of Christ, this is what is happening in the interim. As we come to the close of today's lesson, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, friends, to get serious about your salvation. And even as you do so, remember those in your families, your parents, your, your siblings, your children, your grandchildren. What about your neighbors? What about your work colleagues? What about your friends? These are serious times. And the prophecies of the word of God will be fulfilled to a T. There will be no deviation. You see, this world is heading towards its divine destiny. And if we are to be partakers of th that divine destiny, we have to, to, to get right with God, to straighten up and fly right. Even in this time, we are living. Remember to subscribe to this channel. Give it a thumbs up and share. Tell someone that Mrs. Britain is on. That's a vehicle passing. So you're going to hear a little noise. Yes, tell someone. If you have any questions or comments, write them down below. I am willing to interact with you. I cannot speak everything 
in the video but if you ask your questions we can discuss so until next time when we continue with uh, our next lesson which will be um, the two witnesses maybe you can take some time to review today's lesson let us pray as we close oh God these are solemn times you have pointed us to so that we are not misled into believing that time will go on forever you are eager to bring us into eternity to live with you and angels and sinless beings oh god may the spirit of god help us to examine our hearts so that we can apply our hearts to wisdom thank you amen until next time when mrs britain is on when we look at the two witnesses goodbye <music>